Number 9. Ford Graveyard In a quiet village in the United Kingdom, an urban explorer and YouTuber came across a creepy forgotten Ford Graveyard. Apparently, the YouTuber lived close by and was exploring an abandoned bomb shelter when he caught a glimpse of something strange. After marching through a field, he came upon over 40 different Ford vehicles, cars, vans, and more, all scattered across a random stretch of land. But what makes this story a little spooky is that all the cars appear to have been burned, and it's unclear why. Even though the urban explorer had lived in the area since he was a young child, he had no idea there was a graveyard nearby full of torched vehicles. Even more disturbing was the burned-down house that he also found nearby. There's no information on the house or the cars, or why they were burned. Inside the house were personal belongings that had clearly been forgotten for quite some time. He found a notepad with fancy handwriting and other signs of education, and wondered if the person who once lived there was a teacher of some sort. The whole thing is a complete mystery, and it could be a curious part of the town's dark past. Number 8. The Albanian Submarine Base Hidden within the cliffs of Albania's coastline lies a reminder of its military history and the rapid growth in its military presence following the death of its leader and dictator Enver Hoxha. There are tens of thousands of bunkers and bases across the country, but one of the most interesting ones was found by urban explorers out in Porto Palermo. This sprawling network of concrete tunnels carved into the cliffs once served as a repair station for many of the country's submarines and torpedo ships. The seaward entrances are blocked by heavy iron doors reinforced with concrete so it's not at all easy to get inside. Once you make your way in, you can follow the maze of canals running through the underground passages, which at one point various boats and submarines would have used to get around the complex. The color of the water looks amazing, almost inviting one to swim through it. Explorers even found the rusted remains of a gantry crane suspended high on the tunnel wall, which would have been used to help service the vessels and load in ammunition for the weapons. There are multiple chambers and tunnels inside the base, including a locksmith's workshop, which still had tables and tools scattered about. One of the chambers even looks like something out of a kid's play area with colorful squares covering the ceiling and walls. Number 7. Decomposing Body An urban explorer named Paul Jones from the city of Canterbury in the United Kingdom made a grisly discovery when he wandered through the neglected house of Jackie Palo, a former wrestling star. He ventured deep into the rural property to take pictures, and right away he had a feeling he had made a horrible mistake. Paul discovered many broken down things inside the retired wrestler's crumbling house. Paul loved to take pictures of things left behind by people, and guess the stories behind it all, and was hoping to take photos of an aging grand piano and other nostalgic artifacts. Instead, he came upon a door that was barred with lengths of rope. When he tried to open it, it wouldn't budge. According to Paul himself, he was already expecting a body even before he even saw it. He managed to shove the door open as far as he could, and that was when he saw the man rotting away on the floor. It's unclear how long the dead guy had been there, or even who he was or how he had died. Paul called the police and gave them his statement. As for the owner of the decrepit house, Jackie Paolo was a famous wrestling star in the early 1960s who passed away at the age of 80 in 2006 and would never know of the decomposing body hiding in his house. Number 6. Rumu Prison, Estonia To explore Rumu Prison in Estonia, you'll have to be prepared to get a little bit wet. Initially, Rumu Prison was home to around 400 inmates, who were all forced into hard manual labor as part of their punishment. The work that they would have to do involved chiseling away at the limestone rock in the quarry that the prison was built. Both the quarry and the prison were eventually closed around the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. With nobody living there or working there, the pumps that took away the groundwater were switched off, leaving the location to be slowly swallowed up by the water. Above the surface, you can't see much, just the gray skeletons of a few buildings. However, urban explorers have found more remarkable finds under the water. They found remains of the prison structure, including iron gates and bars, and an entire network of buildings that are not even visible from the surface. You can follow the path that the prisoners and guards would have taken, down submerged stairs and past barred windows. It's quite strange to think that you can freely swim around in a place where many people were confined, and even swim over gates inmates would have loved to have been able to climb. Nowadays, the site has become more popular, not with explorers, but with people looking for a nice spot to sit and relax by the artificial lakeside. Number 5. Zombie Shark An urban explorer from France named Juliette made some disturbing yet fascinating discoveries when she ventured into an abandoned aquarium in Spain. Most of the glass from the tanks was smashed, and the water is pretty much all but gone. 
However, some of the exhibits here are far from empty. Walking through the creepy ex-tourist attraction, Juliette stumbled upon quite a few dead marine animals, seemingly left to die when the place shut down. Among the finds was a starfish and a big pink squid, its eyeballs yellowed but still in one piece. However, the most staggering find was a decomposing shark. Originally in a small tank, it's very likely that it was already dead when it was an exhibit, with its tank filled with chemicals to stop it from decaying. However, with the glass broken and the fluid drained, she was left to the elements. Due to the fact that there are likely still remnants of the chemicals on its body, the shark has started to decay very slowly, making it look a bit like a zombie shark. To add to the creepy feel, there were also other animals in jars, including the remains of further squids and a few octopuses. Suffice it to say, this is like an aquarium out of a horror movie and definitely not one for a family day out. Why do you think they were left here and not taken with the rest of the exhibits? Let us know in the comments below and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 4. Craig House Craig House in Beacon, New York changed the game when it came to the treatment of those suffering from mental health and related illnesses. Set up by Scottish psychiatrist Clarence Slocum, the grand red brick mansion originally named Tioranda was built in 1859 and was converted from a residential building into the first private psychiatric unit spanning over 60 acres of land. Craig House first opened its doors to patients in 1915, offering its residents therapy, gourmet meals, and recreational activities such as golf and painting. Compared to other psychiatric hospitals at the time, the approach was much more humane, especially when things like lobotomies and electroshock therapy were happening elsewhere. The sanatorium had many famous residents over the years, including Zelda, the wife of famous author F. Scott Fitzgerald, Rosemary, the sister of John F. Kennedy, and the mother of Jane Fonda. Such luxury treatment came at a cost, though, and not one that many people could afford. For example, Fitzgerald found it very hard to keep up with the $750 a month payments to keep his wife there, and in the end, he had to relocate her to another institution. That might not seem like a lot now, but remember this was almost 100 years ago. It's easy to see why Craig House demanded such a luxury price tag. With grand fireplaces, oak paneling on the walls, plush leather seating, and even an organ in one of the rooms, it's clear he spared no expense. The hospital closed its doors in 1999, but since then it's remained perfectly preserved exactly the way it was when it was open. The sanitarium is tricky to get into, but that doesn't mean urban explorers haven't snuck inside. Some have even reported that the Victorian mansion doesn't feel empty, with reports of ghost sightings, including a woman with long brown hair on one of the upper floors. The road leading to it is blocked by a big tree and concrete blockades with no trespassing signs everywhere. In 2018, the building was bought by a new owner who is currently restoring it. Number 3. Skulls in the UK in 2021, husband and wife urban explorers Danny and Felicity Duffy were exploring an abandoned pub in the Greater Manchester area of the UK when they discovered a human skull sitting out in the woods near a discarded army jacket. Danny picked it up on camera to get a better look, an action that would later receive criticism from viewers, who said it was disrespectful to disturb it. After realizing what they had found, the two called local authorities. They weren't even sure it was a real skull, and they told the police that it looked like one, but didn't know for sure. Once officers arrived at the scene and investigated, they took the object to be studied further by a forensics team. It was determined the skull was indeed very much real. As veteran explorers, this was the first time the Duffies had seen anything like this. They've since told viewers that they'll be taking a break from exploring and YouTube to recover from this traumatic experience. Number 2. The Airline Training Center not too far from Heathrow Airport in the UK is the Crane Bank British Airways Training Centre. This was the go-to location for many pilots and flight attendants to receive training to prepare them for the flights all around the world. The training centre is filled with all sorts of simulation equipment, including model cockpits and cabins. However, as the site was built in the 1960s, it was also filled with asbestos, a deadly material that, if disturbed, can cause serious lung problems. This, alongside the fact that the equipment is super outdated, led to the closure of the location in 2015. Nowadays, the Crane Bank Training Center is left abandoned, which means many urban explorers have gone inside to take a look. Left inside the building is a cockpit from a Boeing 737 used as a flight simulator, various classrooms still with their desks and chairs lined up, and even a cabin still decked out with all its seating. Scavengers have stripped away anything valuable, such as copper wiring from some of the machinery, and the training models are slowly being covered in grime. 
However, it's still amazing to walk around and take a look at some aviation history. We just hope that people wore adequate protection from the asbestos. As any good flight attendant will tell you, safety first. Number 1. The Working Soviet-Era Crane Normally, when urban explorers enter a building or location, most of the stuff inside is broken and past the point of repair. However, two explorers in Poland managed to stumble upon something that still worked, and it wasn't exactly small either. While wandering through an abandoned warehouse, an urban explorer that goes by the name Shai online and her friends came across a giant crane suspended above the floor. It looked like it would have run on metal rails across the building, which would have once been used to maneuver goods around when the factory was still in operation. Of course, this intrigued the group, and they decided to head up to the crane to get a better look. Sitting over the dusty controls, they thought it was worth trying out, and amazingly, although sending a few sparks flying, the crane actually worked. What makes this truly astounding is that this warehouse was abandoned over 30 years ago, meaning that the crane and the other machinery in the building would not have been operated since then. The closing down of many industries and businesses wasn't uncommon at the time, as following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, a recession took hold in the country as it tried to adapt to post-communist rule, leading to many companies folding. Shai and his pals tried a few more machines in the warehouse, including some rusty bulldozers among others, but sadly only the crane would sputter into life. Either way, it marks a truly crazy find. Eight, war-torn fields. A wheat field in Berdachev, about 150 kilometers southwest of Kyiv, is a peaceful haven full of cow pastures and fruit fields. But 80 years ago during World War II, these fields were a scene full of gore and fire. In July 1941, the Soviet Army's 44th Armored Division stormed through the area. Wave after wave, German machine guns and mortars shot at them. These suicide assaults were meant to push back the Varmek's 11th Panzer Division, which tried to capture nearby settlements. Through the mayhem of thousands of bodies, only a few made it close to Nazi lines. Nowadays, an archaeologist named Alexander Afansiev travels the fields with a metal detector. The soil is still littered with old shell fragments, cartridges, bayonet pieces, and even old grenades. These remnants of battle, as well as the bones of soldiers, can be found everywhere. The findings give a grim picture of the 1941 events. All of the infantrymen dispatched to attack the Nazi lines were doomed. Many of them were dead before firing a single shot. Some died while carrying grenade clusters, trying to throw them into enemy foxholes. Many injured, afraid, or shell-shocked troops attempted to flee and tumbled into impact craters. Afansiev and his comrades sometimes come across skeletons with pistol bullet holes. Germans would often wander the charred battlefield, finishing off the wounded with two gunshots from their Lugers. Many of the bodies carry personal belongings that hint at the life these soldiers once had. Water jars with scarcely legible writing or carvings, rotting sections of newspapers with poetry, basic handmade penknives, and more. Sadly, the identities are never found. Their dog tags 1941 have degraded and are illegible. No German soldiers have been found, though. The Nazis gathered their fallen and buried them in Berdachev Center, where Adolf Hitler would later visit. Afansiev and his crew paid for the installation of a tiny memorial stone near the garden where they unearthed over 100 remains of Russian soldiers. It sadly has no names listed. 7. Higgins Landing Craft a dwindling reservoir on the border of Nevada and Arizona has revealed a submerged World War II boat. The Higgins Landing Craft, which has been below the surface for quite some time, is now about halfway out of the water in Lake Mead. According to Las Vegas Scuba, it was used to survey the Colorado River decades ago, then sold to the marina before sinking. Around 1,500 similar Higgins boats were deployed to Normandy on June 6, 1944, otherwise known as D-Day thanks to the production of several thousand landing craft made by Higgins Industries in New Orleans between 1942 and 1945. This boat is the latest in a sequence of discoveries made possible by falling water levels in Lake Mead, the biggest man-made reservoir in the US, kept back by the Hoover Dam. Two sets of human remains were even discovered this past May. According to experts, climate change and dryness have caused the surface to plummet more than 170 feet since 1983. As far as the Higgins boat is concerned, they altered the course of the war. 
Initially, ships had to assault ports directly, which were often heavily guarded. But armies could unload on a beach utilizing Higgins' boats, giving them more possibilities for attacking positions. This also put a strain on the defending armies. Defenders had to cover more shoreline instead of focusing on only a few access points. These boats enabled Allied forces to deploy ashore in the Pacific and European theaters of World War II. This development saw a huge boost to Higgins Industries. In 1938, there were just 75 employees. By 1943, there were over 20,000. Higgins' staff was the city's first to be racially mixed. His personnel comprised undrafted white men, women, African Americans, the elderly, and those with disabilities. Everyone was paid the same amount based on their work grade. They reacted by breaking production records, producing over 20,000 boats before the conclusion of the war. So, not only did those boats revolutionize naval tactics, they broke down segregation barriers in the workplace. 6. USS Samuel B. Roberts According to Ocean Explorers, a US Navy destroyer escort that fought a Japanese fleet in the greatest naval battle of World War II has become the deepest wreck ever discovered. It was found in the waters of the Philippines. The USS Samuel B. Roberts, sometimes known as the Sammy B, was discovered on a deep slope at 22,916 feet last month. That is 1,400 feet further than the USS Johnston, found last year by American navigator Victor Vescovo. Sammy B participated in the Battle of Samar and the final part of the Battle of Late Gulf in October 1944, when the Imperial Japanese Navy sustained its greatest loss of ships. They failed to remove US troops from late, which they'd attacked before as part of the Philippines' independence. He revealed the new discovery in collaboration with EYOS Expeditions. It was an extraordinary honor to locate this incredibly famous ship and, by doing so, have the chance to retell her story of heroism and duty to those who may not know of the ship and her crew's sacrifice, Vescobo said. While attacking the force commanded by the battleship Congo, the destroyer escort sunk a Japanese heavy cruiser with a torpedo and severely damaged another vessel. It was brutally struck by the Congo and sank after exhausting almost all its ammo. 89 people died while 120 were saved, including the commander, Lieutenant Commander Robert W. Copeland. Copeland said there was no better honor than leading the troops who demonstrated such amazing bravery in marching into battle despite slim chances of survival. The explorer stated that before the discovery, historical accounts of the wreck's location were not precise. The hunt required the installation and operation of the furthest side-scan sonar ever built. The Sami B is a sacred war burial that serves as a reminder to all Americans of the price paid by previous generations for the freedoms we enjoy today. 5. SS Iron Crown When the submerged wreck of a ship torpedoed by the Japanese 80 years ago was found in the Bay Strait, it not only provided Bill Stewart with peace knowing where his father was buried, but it also led to a reconnection with his long-lost sister. Mr. Stewart and Beryl Johnson lost their father when the SS Iron Crown was attacked about 62 miles off Victoria's south coast in June 1942. Frank Stewart was one of the 38 individuals killed in the wreck. Bill and his sister were transferred to an orphanage when their dad was at sea because their mother had died in the years before. Bill, now 91, still becomes distressed when he remembers being forced to say goodbye to his sister. Mr. Stewart eventually moved to Sydney, but Beryl stayed in Adelaide. Despite this, neither sibling lost faith that they would be reunited. The two of us were looking for each other, but got no support from the orphanage, Mr. Stewart explained. The wreck of the SS Iron Crown was found in April 2019 by the Hobart-based CSIRO research vessel Investigator, and a memorial service was conducted for the families of those who died aboard. The ship, which was roughly 330 feet long, was discovered upright and still fairly intact about 2,296 feet below the water's surface, according to authorities. According to Peter Harvey, a marine archaeologist, it was the only ship sunk by a torpedo in the state seas. On Merchant Navy Day, more than 50 descendants of the Iron Crown's crew gathered in Melbourne Shrine of Remembrance for a memorial event. Mr. Stewart was placed in contact with Kylie Watson, a family member who would help him search for Beryl. She began looking for Miss Johnson right away. 
When all the proof led to Adelaide, they called local newspapers and placed an ad asking anyone with information on Beryl Johnson, previously known as Beryl Stewart, to come forth. She stepped forward, and the two have talked every day since their reunion last year. I couldn't get into Bill's arms quick enough. We just hugged one another, and we couldn't let each other go, Miss Johnson said in a touching recollection of that day. Hey, real quick, if you're new to the channel, welcome. What kind of videos would you like to see on American Eye? Tell us in the comments below and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. 4. Dog Tags A military ID tag, popularly known as Dog Tags, that was lost in Saipan during World War II, has been discovered and will be returned to relatives of the original owner. In anticipation of the sewage and drainage project, which is being funded by the Northern Marianas Housing Corp, the IRP archaeological team found the World War II dog tag in San Jose. A background study by IRP employees found that the tag belonged to William Conrad Stoll Jr., a member of the United States Marine Corps Reserves, who served as a captain and executive officer of the Marines' 5th Amphibious Tractor Battalion in the World War II Battle of Saipan. The tag was discovered on the Real Invasion Beach, where Stoll fought for three days. He took part in the naval landings in Tinian and Iwo Jima after Saipan. He left the Marine Corps in 1962 with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel before retiring from service. He later died in 2008. At a meeting between IRP personnel and Rita Chong de la Cruz, a historic preservation officer, it was decided the tag should be given back to Stoll's family. Catherine Stoll Bouchon, Stoll's daughter, decided to pass this relic on to her son, a Marine Corps veteran. Bouchon expressed her appreciation for IRP's efforts in investigating the history of the tag and bringing this discovery to the attention of her family. The tag will be returned to Bouchon and her family very soon. 3. Ashes of Nazi German Victims A mass grave site containing the ashes of 8,000 individuals has been discovered near a former German World War II detention camp in Poland. The Institute of National Remembrance, IPN, discovered about 17.5 tons of human ashes near the old Soldau concentration camp, which is now the town of Dzialdowo. SS General Otto Rasch created and organized the camp, and by the time of the camp's closure in 1945, nearly half of the 30,000 prisoners had been murdered since it opened in 1939. The institute reported that they found two mass graves. One was 91 feet long, and the other was 39 feet long. The Soldau, as it was known by the Germans, was first used to house people who'd been forcibly removed from their homes by Nazis in an effort to ethnically purge the Polish East Prussian region of non-Germans. But Soldau was later established as a forced labor camp in an old Polish army barracks. But not long after this, it began conducting the early gassing trials on prisoners with mental disorders. The people whose ashes are buried here were killed and robbed, stated Tomasz Jankowski of the IPN. He also said they would try and unveil the identity of as many victims as they could. 2. World War II Engine The engine of a World War II aircraft was discovered underwater off the New Jersey shore earlier this month as a former National Guardsman was fishing for squid. Randy Camp and his captain, Jake Whiskett, made the discovery when they felt something particularly hefty in their net. The engine was recognized as a Pratt & Whitney 18-cylinder R2800 by William LaSalle, director of the Lower Township Museum. According to LaSalle, the engine might have been used in a number of commercial and military aircraft, like the Northrop P61 Black Widow fighter or the Douglas DC-6. It was used for freight, military, and wildfire control efforts. LaSalle suggested the engine could have come from a Grumman F-6F Hellcat, a carrier-based fighter aircraft that was used to oppose Japan's Mitsubishi A6M-0 during the Pacific War. The engine had been buried in the Atlantic Ocean for close to 70 years. During World War II, the US Navy kept some administrative headquarters at the former Cape May Hotel, making it a key stronghold. Because the region was threatened by German subs, a heavy military presence was necessary, which largely replaced the tourism business until the Navy's full evacuation in 1946. To this day, it's fairly common to come across bombs in the region, some of which have exploded while others have been donated to the Naval Air Station Wildwood Aviation Museum. 
The airplane's engine will likely need to be cleaned and aired out before being shown at the museum, with a plaque commemorating Camp's incredible finding. 1. Nazi Gold According to World War II treasure hunters, four tons of Nazi gold has been discovered on the grounds of a deserted mansion in southern Poland. The Silesian Bridge Foundation reported it found a buried canister while using geo-radar after determining the position with the help of an old SS journal. The circular metal canister, measuring only 4 feet long and 20 inches in diameter, was in the gardens of an 18th-century mansion used as a brothel by Hitler's SS agents. When the Foundation learned of the geo-radar results, the Heritage Preservation Authorities gave permission to conduct a sequence of digging drills to inspect the site. The findings of these tests revealed abnormal interference in the Earth. The initial drill produced unusual contortions on one side. They tried again, though, and got the same results on the opposite side, but the third probe hit an item. According to the Foundation, the canister had gold that was deposited at the Reichsbank in Breslau and taken by SS Commander Heinrich Himmler in the last months of war to support the construction of the Fourth Reich. The information stated this specific deposit was concealed by an SS official named Von Stein. The SS wanted to use the money to restore Ukraine's agriculture to feed the new Reich. The Foundation claims to have uncovered the location using secret papers and a treasure map obtained from the ancestors of Waffen SS officers. They supposedly belonged to a secret launch that dated back 1,000 years. This collection of documents contains an SS officer's wartime journal that reveals 11 places of World War II wealth stashed in the last months of the war. Based on the journal, an incredible amount of wealth, art, jewelry, and sacred artifacts were hidden in safe locations across Lower Silesia to avoid them getting into the hands of the advancing Red Army. The officer, identified as Michaelis in the journal, was reported to be a liaison between top SS officials and local nobles seeking assistance in protecting their property from Soviets. According to the Foundation, the diary belonged to a mysterious religious sect known as the Quedlinburgers. Due to its ties with the first German ruler, Henry the Fowler, who lived in the 10th century, the little German town of Quedlinburg in Lower Saxony was closely connected with Nazi cult worship groups in the 1930s and 40s. According to him, the Quedlinburg group and the foundation want any uncovered riches to be given to their rightful owners. According to the organization, it's currently awaiting permission to hoist the canister to the surface. They're also waiting on approval from army officials since the foundation believes the hiding site was booby-trapped by SS soldiers. 7. Chernobyl Suicide Squad on April 26, 1986, a late-night safety test at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant near Pripyat, Ukraine went awry, and the world saw the greatest nuclear disaster in history. Hundreds of people died in the immediate aftermath, and thousands more were killed in the years that followed. The incident sent 400 times more radiation into the atmosphere than the Hiroshima atomic bomb, contaminating millions of acres of the surrounding area. On May 4, 1986, merely days after the tragedy, mechanical engineer Alexei Ananenko, senior engineer Valery Bespolov, and shift supervisor Boris Baranov volunteered for a mission that many thought was suicide. They were promised that their families would be taken care of in the event that they did not survive. The result of their mission would determine the destiny of millions of people. Within a few days, it was discovered that hot radioactive material was melting through the concrete reactor floor and slowly dripping into the pools below. The lava-like fluid would ignite a radiation-tainted steam explosion if it came into contact with the water, destroying the entire facility and its three additional reactors, generating inconceivable destruction and radioactive fallout from which the world would take a long time to recover. The pools, which held around 20 million liters of water, needed to be drained, and the only way to do so was to physically close the appropriate valves in the now-flooded basement. The crew was successful in locating the valves and draining the water, finishing the job before the molten radioactive steel could reach it. Their bold actions saved millions of lives. In the decades following the catastrophe, it was stated that the men had passed away from acute radiation sickness. In actuality, though, all three of them lived. As of 2015, it was believed that two of them, Ananenko and Bespolov, were still alive. Boris Baranov, the shift supervisor, died of a heart attack in 2005. 6. The Raid at Cabernet 
One of the most daring and effective rescue missions in the history of warfare was carried out by the US Army in January 1945. The release of the civilians trapped in the Japanese camp near Cabanatuan in the Philippines became known as the Great Raid. The rescue effort arose from the Battle of Bataan, a massive military setback for the United States and its allies. Tens of thousands were taken as prisoners of war by the Japanese Imperial Army. They were forced to march for long miles in terrible circumstances in what would become known as the Bataan Death March. The captives were eventually imprisoned in the Cabanatuan camp. While many were quickly transported elsewhere, roughly 500 men were still being kept in inhumane conditions by the beginning of 1945. In addition to sickness and famine, prisoners were subjected to the harshness of their captors and the continual fear of death. Many feared their time was up when General Douglas MacArthur and the US Army advanced. The US was set on getting the soldiers out no matter how tough it would be. The 6th Army was entrusted with devising a rescue strategy, and they realized the critical role Filipino guerrillas might play in any attack. The task was assigned to around 100 rangers and scouts, as well as 200 guerrillas. They were granted the go-ahead on January 30th. The soldiers waited for dusk to fall, after trekking nearly 31 miles, 50 kilometers to get into position. Then, they all attacked at once. The guards were distracted as a special P-61 Black Widow night fighter jet approached. When the Americans and Filipinos entered the camp perimeters, the Japanese were taken off guard. In a quick but violent engagement, an estimated 500 Japanese troops were slain. Only four Americans were killed, and almost everyone was securely brought back over American lines to safety. The Cabanatuan raid was more than just a stunning military success. The men who'd been rescued were able to recount the narrative of the Bataan Death March. The American people were shocked, and they vowed once more to support the Pacific War effort. President Roosevelt thanked the troops participating in the rescue effort for their deeds, and their bravery that night has inspired several novels and films. 5. Bat 21 Bravo Rarely has a country's military gone to such lengths and been ready to make such sacrifices for the sake of one man's life. The US was anxious as Lieutenant Colonel Isil Hamilton took to the skies of North Vietnam. If apprehended, Hamilton could be forced to reveal vital information. On April 2, 1972, Air Force Navigator Lieutenant Colonel Isil Jean Hamilton was flying over enemy territory in an electronic warfare plane with the call sign Bat-21. The plane, which was carrying a crew of six, was suddenly attacked. The tail was blown off by anti-aircraft fire. Hamilton was able to bail out with the parachute as the aircraft plummeted to the ground. He landed just south of the line dividing the two combatants. Even worse, Hamilton had been identified as a vital expert in electronic surveillance by North Vietnamese intelligence. They recognized the 53-year-old was out in the jungle and were determined to apprehend him, dead or alive. The Americans immediately initiated a rescue effort. They knew roughly where Hamilton was because a forward air controller pilot had maintained communication with him as he parachuted to the ground. Nonetheless, the Air Force officer saw the necessity of getting to a location where he could be rescued. He was able to communicate over the radio and in code using the names of American golf courses, so his comrades understood where to pick him up. In the hopes of recovering their soldier, the Americans dispatched a scout jet. This was shot down, forcing both pilots to bail out. Six troops were killed while carrying out a rescue effort for them. It took a total of 11 days to reach Hambleton. During the period, 11 soldiers were killed, a plane was destroyed, and hundreds of American and South Vietnamese forces were put in grave danger. Furthermore, plans for a large ground assault were put on hold until the rescue mission took place. To simply survive, Hamilton was forced to steal from villages and even kill a peasant farmer who tried to apprehend him. Finally, Hamilton was found by a Navy SEAL unit and transported to safety under the cover of darkness. It sparked heated controversy, with some people believing that putting so many people's lives in danger to save one guy was wrong. After the war, Hamilton left the Air Force and passed away in 2004 at the age of 85. 4. Operation Red Wings Operation Red Wings took place from June 27 to July 5, 2005 during the Afghanistan War. In an attempt to stabilize the region, the United States began a military operation in Kunar province to kill anti-coalition militia commander Ahmed Shah and his soldiers. But the Taliban forces ambushed the four-man US Navy SEALs team, killing three of them, as well as killing 16 additional SEALs and night stalkers when they shot down their Chinook helicopter, which had been dispatched to retrieve the crew. The militants sustained huge losses and were forced to temporarily retreat, but they returned three weeks later, 
forcing Operation Whalers. This operation eventually succeeded in eliminating Shah's forces, thereby avenging the failure of Operation Red Wings. Lieutenant Michael P. Murphy, Petty Officer 2nd Class Danny Dietz, Petty Officer 2nd Class Matthew Axelson, and Navy Hospital Corpsman 2nd Class Marcus Luttrell were part of a four-man Navy SEAL reconnaissance and surveillance team deployed by Chinook late on the night of June 27, 2005, to a saddle between Sortolo Sar and Gatagal Sar. They were spotted by local goat herders after moving to a designated overwatch location. After determining that they were civilians, the crew freed them, despite disagreements over whether to leave them free and risk death, tie them up and risk civilian deaths, or kill them and violate the rules of engagement. They were ambushed by Taliban gunmen, and the greatly outnumbered team received severe wounds from both battle and diving off the side of a ridge into a wide ravine. Axelson, Murphy, and Dietz were all killed. Before being killed by the Taliban, Murphy managed to notify Lieutenant Commander Eric S. Christensen of his team's plight and to seek aid. A quick reaction group of SEALs led by Christensen hopped on Chinook helicopters and flew directly to the scene without gunship escort. When they arrived, one of the helicopters was shot down by the Taliban, killing everybody on board. Luttrell, who was severely wounded and had been hiding between rock crevices, was rescued and hidden in a house by a local named Mohammed Gulam, who sent a mountain man to the nearest American base to alert them of his location. The Taliban later attacked the area again, but the people held out until American troops came and drove the insurgents out. He thanked the folks who'd helped him before being evacuated. He'd barely survived his injuries. 3. Operation Ivory Coast the Sonte prison camp, which lies only 23 miles 37 kilometers west of Hanoi, North Vietnam, was the landing site for 56 U.S. Army Special Forces men on November 21, 1970. The team was led by Air Force Brigadier General Leroy J. Manor and Army Colonel Arthur D. Bull Simons. The mission's goal was to retrieve some 70 American prisoners of war believed to be kept at the camp, which was located in an area with 12,000 North Vietnamese troops stationed within 5 miles 8 kilometers. The raid revealed that all the detainees had already been transferred to a different camp, rendering the mission a failure. From May 25th to November 20th, 1970, the carefully picked raiders were thoroughly trained and prepared for the operation at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. The attack was accomplished successfully despite the lack of captives, with only two fatalities and the unintended loss of a plane. A year later, the US intelligence community underwent a significant overhaul as a result of criticism of intelligence failures to establish that the camp was empty, both in the public and inside President Richard M. Nixon's administration. 2. Apollo 13 Apollo 13 was the third mission that was supposed to land on the moon. The craft launched on April 11, 1970, but two days later, on April 13, the space shuttle was having some trouble. An explosion shook the aircraft at 9.08 p.m., roughly 56 hours into the trip. The second oxygen tank had blown up, cutting off the usual supply of oxygen, power, light, and water. Houston, we've had a problem here, Jim Lovell informed Mission Control. The command module, CM, was leaking oxygen and losing fuel cells at a fast rate. The moon landing mission was called off since they weren't going to be able to breathe for much longer. Oxygen was also used in the fuel cell to generate electricity, so not only were they going to suffocate, but they shut off all their electrical equipment, including their heaters, and they got extremely cold. The astronauts went to the lunar module to survive and use it as a sort of lifeboat. The LM was designed to transport humans to the moon's surface and back. Hopefully, it would be enough to take them back to Earth. Navigation was extremely challenging, and the crew and mission control had to calculate the modifications in propulsion and direction necessary to return the ship to Earth by hand. As they approached the Earth, they weren't even sure that their parachutes were going to work. On April 15, 1970, the crew of Apollo 13 achieved a Guinness World Record for the furthest distance traveled by humans from Earth. They were 158 miles, 254 kilometers from the lunar surface on the moon's far side, and 248,655 miles, 400,171 kilometers above the Earth's surface. For three days, Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert huddled in the freezing lunar module, and Hayes contracted an illness. On April 17th, the repressurized command module was successfully powered on, and they were able to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Everyone held their breath, but the astronauts had returned home safely. While the astronauts didn't make it to the moon, the mission was considered successful, since they were able to bring the astronauts home safely on a severely damaged ship. 1. Operation Thunderbolt 
On June 27, 1976, militants of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine hijacked an Air France jet, PLO. It was supposed to travel from Tel Aviv to Paris, but it was rerouted to Uganda's Entebbe airport. The terrorists requested the release of 40 of their comrades from Israeli jail. If their demands were not met, they threatened to execute the passengers. All non-Israeli passengers were released. After that, 94 people remained, together with 12 members of the Air France crew. The Israeli government, refusing to give it, tried to put a stop to the hijacking. The difficulty was that Air France jet was in Uganda, and Uganda's leader, Idi Amin, had expressed sympathy and support for the hijackers. The rescue operation would have to take place on foreign land in a volatile situation. A week after the plane was hijacked, 100 commandos tracked 1,553 miles 2, kilometers to Uganda. To hide from the radar, they flew low, sometimes as low as 100 feet 46 meters. The commandos arrived under the cover of night. They headed towards the massive terminal in a black Mercedes and two black Land Rovers. They were hoping the guards would misidentify them as Idi Amin and his bodyguards. Rescuers left their vehicle and rushed to the terminal building on foot. A shootout erupted, killing three Israeli passengers as well as all of the hijackers. As the rescuers attempted to flee, they encountered Ugandan forces, who sustained a number of wounds, including Prime Minister Netanyahu. Eventually, passengers and commandos boarded Hercules transport planes and returned to Israel and safety. In total, 102 captives were freed. Some countries condemned Israel for committing an act of terrorism on foreign land, while others expressed their approval. For Israelis, Operation Thunderbolt became legendary, and the individuals involved, particularly Netanyahu, became war heroes. Thanks for watching. Which one of these missions do you think was the most dangerous? Tell us in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.